I want to now introduce a friend and colleague of mine, Wendy Wachtel, president of the Joseph Drown Foundation and one of the center's founding board members who will inter introduce and engage Tom Steyer and Kat Taylor in a, in a conversation about philanthropy. Thank you. Thank both of you for coming down to rainy Southern California <laughs> for this event. We appreciate it. Um, and I'd like to really start by allowing both of you to introduce yourselves a little bit to the audience and talk um, about your background and what got you to where we are today. Why don't you start, Kathy? Okay. Uh, well, I'm Kat Taylor. I was actually born in California. I was educated uh, at Harvard in undergraduate, and I went to Stanford and um, did a JD MBA. Uh, I grew up with parents who were very civically minded, and they participated in everything from PTA to political campaigns, um, stumping for a zero population growth, which we, of course, obliterated by having four children. Um, but I was trained as a young person to be uh, invested in my community. And from a very early age, to see the promise of all people, of every individual, and to recognize that we fare a lot better together than we do apart. Uh, so pretty much um, always I thought I would have a career in something akin to philanthropy, whether that was in uh, some sort of social justice movement or um, the environmental commons. Uh, I currently am the CEO of a triple bottom line bank that we started called One Pacific Coast Bank that's dedicated to achieving social justice and environmental well-being at the same time that it's financially sustainable. And I know we're going to talk about that later, about our view that business is a powerful change agent. I also preside loosely and unprofessionally over a sustainable agriculture ranch, ranch that produces uh, grass-fed beef, uh, pork, chicken, turkey, eggs, and sometimes fish. Um, and it's really set up to be a demonstration ranch. Those are the two things that I focus on at the moment. So I am uh, Catherine's husband. Um, my name's Tom Steyer. I grew up in New York. I went to Yale. I worked for a couple years on Wall Street after Yale. Um, I then went to Stanford Business School at the behest of my older brother, who's, a Stanford, who's sitting right there, who is a Stanford undergrad, Stanford Law uh, graduate. And we have another brother when we were growing up. And our parents, our father was a Wall Street lawyer, and my mother ran school volunteer programs in public schools in New York City and then <laughs> taught reading in the Brooklyn House of Detention. So I would say our um, family always had a strong uh, community involvement. Uh, my brother Jim has started a series of nonprofits which have prospered to this day. Um, and when I asked my mother when I was probably 25 and trying to figure out what our family was about. I, you know, I said, you know, who are we? What do we stand for? And she said, we've never been rich or powerful, but we've always been well-educated and we've participated in our community. So I think that's what Jim has always done. And I actually came out of Stanford Business School, worked for a couple more years on Wall Street back in New York, moved back to California to start an investment business in the beginning of 1986, worked there for 27 years, was a partner in a private equity firm in San Francisco as well on the investment committee, and stopped doing that at the end of 2012 to focus on the you know, policy giving community oriented parts of my life because I had gotten to a point where I felt like it was overwhelmingly interesting and consuming and I really couldn't keep doing my old job anymore because I just had lost my passion for it and I was crazy about doing this other stuff, which is largely about um, energy and climate, which I'm a, I like to describe myself as a true freak about, which I think will probably come through today. And I am, you know, Jim and I have started a think tank, which is basically climate and energy and kids and families. And I'm also, 
have run a couple of, I've co-chaired two propositions, one in 2010, the No on 23 campaign, and in 2012, the th Proposition 39, both of which fortunately came out the right way. And I'm also pretty much of a freak that California should be, since I'm an adopted son, you know, converts are always the greatest believers. I love California and I feel like there are many things about it that are perfect and we can do better in some others and I'm pretty much crazy about the idea that we do better on those. So at the center, we have long, over the last couple years, had a lot of conversations about one's philanthropic journey, especially apropos of families and individuals. And we talk a little, we've, we've watched as families um, begin to get involved in philanthropy, get more involved in um, what matters to them most, refine and create sort of strategic philanthropy. And you two together have very much been a part of that uh, process along that continuum. Can you talk a little bit about that? I have the list. <laughs> it's actually, um, so yes, I would say uh, early in our philanthropic career, I think it was a fairly conventional approach to sitting on boards and being good fundraisers for the organizations we cared about and knew something about, and then supporting the work of our friends where they were serving the due diligence role for us. That's still a very big part of what we do, but we took a more proactive view towards philanthropy about 10 years ago when we realized that um, if we were going to invest a lot of money, and that has been our aim our whole life, easy for me to say since I didn't make it, but that really we wanted to take our resources in our lifetime, lead an integrated life where, not one where we made a lot of money over the first two thirds, and then over the last third, gave it away in ways to mitigate the damage we'd done in the first two thirds, um, and also to do it in a way that it impact, that it was our choice in our life and not one that would hang over as a legacy for our children so that they could have a clean canvas and make their own life. Um, in any event, at the time we were wrestling with trying to meet those parameters, we made a commitment that if we were going to invest heavily in anything, we were going to take operating roles. We were going to be in the driver's seat. That's why I'm the CEO of the bank. That's why Tom's the chairman of the board of the bank. That's why he was the co-chair of No on Prop 23, that we would really commit ourselves, our decision-making, and our success, or lack thereof, to the project at hand, that we would view business as a change agent, uh, that it needs, it can't be something to the side, it has to be central to what's going on, um, that the mission of anything we do is at the core. It's not an extracurricular, it's not something you append afterwards. It informs every strategic decision and action you take in the company or the nonprofit. Uh, that we would focus, but do it from a system standpoint. So rarely do people tell you that a focus is three things, but we focus on three things that are highly interrelated, good energy, good money, good food. They have synergies back and forth between them, and it'll be hard to cure one of them without attending to the other two. We wanted things to be measurable and hold ourselves to real metrics of outcomes, not just outputs. And it needs to be fun. We, you have to get up and do this every day with a lot of passion, and it's many, many hours a day. And I will say personally, a lot of the fun in my life comes from the company that I get to keep. Extraordinary co commitment and dedication by the people my age, and unbelievable human talent coming, knocking on our door to be involved with this. Because these young people do lead integrated lives. They want to be on a campaign, on a bandwagon, and they, they bring to it extraordinary talents. The last thing I'll say is that too late I realized that there is culture to everything we do, every organization that's created, and if you don't attend to culture, you get an unintentional one, which is rarely a good thing. So we've taken a renewed focus on culture. I've really thought about the idea of philanthropy because it doesn't exactly capture <laughs> what we're trying to do, because I think that often money is really important. It may be wholly necessary, but it's never enough. And so in thinking about what we're trying to do, I, I think I've tried to think about it as being involved in different areas and organizations, including money, but knowing that there are very many different ways of giving in society and trying not to forget that 
you know, not just the people who are working in the nonprofits or the organizations or the campaigns we're involved with, but also, you know, the teachers and policemen and sure. nurses and doctors. The, the different ways that people give in society are all incredibly valuable. And so when I think about what we're doing, I do think money really helps, but I try not to forget the human element of, you know, which is central to any success. And so in thinking about what we're doing, I try and think about what am I personally passionate about and also being aware that there are a lot of people who are giving in ways that may be more significant than the way that I'm giving, even though I might be supplying more of the dough than they are. So it sounds to me like you guys share a philosophy, but the family, but you, your passions are slightly different. Can you talk about that family dynamic and how you do that together and what you do separately? Sure. I mean, Catherine described three things which are basically um, good food, good energy, good money, that we're trying to create you know, some form of push in those areas to solve problems or to create organizations that have a positive impact. So I will tell you a short story, which is this. You know, for the first 10 years of our marriage, it, Catherine's a JD MBA and I'm a humble MBA, but I'm pretty good at adding up a sum of numbers. And so when it comes to a discussion, I'm pretty analytical, I'm pretty linear. I can put together a, you know, fairly straightforward, argument, it sounds pretty convincing, including to myself. So the first 10 years of our marriage, I would, if we didn't have the same view of something and we discussed it, generally my way of laying out the facts would co come that we would do what I wanted. And after 10 years, I looked back and every time we'd had a disagreement, we'd pretty much done what I wanted and it had always been wrong. <laughs> so at that point I decided, well, we're gonna to have to, even though I don't understand what Kat's talking about, that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> and so when we think about how we've divided this up, you know, in terms of good food, Catherine had this passion about what, how to use the land and how that could be used in food production and how it was a part of you know, carbon sinks. And it really was very, very hard for someone who's a simple MBA to understand. But I realized this was after 10 years, so I was basically, fine, we're definitely doing that, whatever it is you're talking about, that's, that's what we're gonna do. And so, really, she has taken the lead in that because she had this holistic picture of what we were trying to do, which has been scarily borne out, and it's gradually come to life. And in terms of the bank, I mean, we basically sat there in two th the end of 2004, 2005, and decided, we need to do this. This is something we have expertise for. You know, we have limited expertise. This is something that we should be able to figure out. You know, we have the right degrees. We have the right, um, you know, educational background. Kat's grandfather bought 46 banks in the state of California. She has the right historical pedigree. We thought this is something we can do. But it became, you know, what really happened with the bank was that Catherine took it over. We had a couple of CEOs. You know, I'm a huge believer in leadership, particularly in any organization. And the smaller the organization, the more overwhelming, overwhelmingly important the leadership is. And we can see in our bank, we had two bankers who were good bankers, but Catherine had the, mission, the passion for our mission and the brains and the leadership and the inspiration. And we, you know, as I always say, we have the best CEO of our bank we're ever gonna have right now. And so, you know, I occasionally make a few points around the edges, but by and large, I try not to intrude. And I'm just worried that if I ever let her into the energy system area, I'm gonna get pushed out over to the side and <laughs> I'm gonna be just putting in my two cents every now and then. So that's how we divvied it up. And it was embarrassingly nice to me, but it's particularly humbling in a room of such incredible collective philanthropic wisdom. I will say um, I am the most unconventional CEO probably that exists, and it's a wonder that the regulators, who are hopefully not in the room, ever went for this. But uh, we did sort of swaddle my leadership with an enormous amount of banking expertise, um, but it really took Tom's mandate as a very accomplished investor to say, no, this is the way we're going to do it. And I think that's an analogy for just about every sector 
in society right now because of the dramatic changes of having 7 billion people, extreme climate change, extreme income disparity. You could argue that there's nothing but room for improvement. Every sector is underperforming, and we have to find new ways to do just about everything. We're not going to find new ways by going to establish track recorded people who can't change what they've been doing for 45 years, but it's really scary to do that. So you need a combination of credibility and experimentation. I guess that's what I'd call it. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk about the Giving Pledge a little bit, um, what, which, which you signed. Um, how were you recruited? How, how did that happen? I mean, I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I knew Warren Buffett well, but I knew Warren Buffett a little bit. And so most people take Warren Buffett's call. I'm one of most people who do, in fact, take Warren Buffett's call. So um, he called up to ask if I were willing to do it. And in all fair, I mean, I really wanted to do it because I felt that what the Gateses and Warren were trying to do, from my perspective, was to publicly and visibly show a responsibility for the most fortunate people in society to everybody else in society. And that they were basically making the point that we are all bound together, that, that we know it, that we're not trying to separate ourselves from our fellow citizens, that in effect, if you've gotten great advantage, therefore you're gonna have the responsibility to participate in society, the way my mother said, fully and to take responsibility that you're not gonna prosper while everybody else doesn't prosper. And I felt that was, particularly when they did it, it was at a time of great income disparity. You know, I think a lot of bitterness and a feeling that you know, everybody was out for themselves and trying to game the system. And I thought the statement that they were making was a really valuable and important one. I also felt like this was a little bit giving the sleeves off my vest because we were always going to do this. I mean, it's kind of, you know, will you sign a pledge to breathe for the next hour? Yes. So, but I felt the message was super important and I really respect those guys. And I felt as if, if we're going to be foot soldiers in this movement, that's fine with me. If you guys want to carry the ball and make this point and push it forward, I, anything I can do to help you guys do that, I'm happy to do and I'm proud to do it and I don't need to get credit for it. It's something that I'm you know, very happy to see you guys succeed in. And to that point of um, if you're going to do it anyway, why, why does the pledge matter? I came to see that joining movements in and of itself is really important. There's something called the B Corporation community. Um, they're corporations who, under the statutes of their states, are allowed to say that they are giving equal consideration to equity and the environment as to financial sustainability. And in, the, in a technical sense, it's a defense against a private shareholder act, action on the grounds that the company hasn't maximized shareholder profit. S since our bank is, doesn't have private shareholders and is owned by a foundation, I never really saw a need to join the B Corporation movement because we don't need to defend against such an action. And in taking that analysis, I missed the point. When I finally was educated by people that this was a movement and a community and it was important to join it and we went through the process, the process alone was valuable to really understand in minute detail what your impact is and whether you're measuring up and the community itself, that we are much stronger as a one member of 533 B corporations than we could ever be on our own, and it's a huge statement to the world that there's another way to do business. So I feel the same way about the Giving Pledge. And has anything changed for you in the process of signing the pledge? And did you talk to your kids about it? You know, as I said, my brother's here, and we've always had, when we were growing up, we had this very straightforward deal with my parents, which, which was basically that they, my father, you know, was a successful lawyer, and he basically said to us, I will pay for your schooling, and I will pay even for grad school, and the minute you graduate from grad school, 
you know, you might get a trip out of me, but that's it. And so our big brother, for instance, came back, for, went to law school, came, went, to, went off for two months to Asia to tour around, came back and moved back in with my parents and had a job as a lawyer in New York. And after two weeks, my father was like, Hume, you have two weeks until your clothing is on the street. He's like, Dad, you know, I'm working so hard. He's like, two weeks. So the deal that we, and that was what I grew up with, and it seemed really fair to me. Because there was no expectation that there was a soft landing or anything else. The expectation was you were going to educate yourself and get this awesome opportunity to create human capital for yourself, and then you're going to have to use it. And that was kind of the deal that we explained to our kids when they were younger. Our kids are between 19 and 24. And we basically said, this is the deal. And so you can get this great deal from us, but you're going to have to take care of yourself. So don't have an expectation that it's going to be you know, a soft landing for you down the road. You're going to have to, you're, when you go to school, you're going to have to do your homework because you're going to have to come out of there and be prepared to deal with the real world. And as, we, as they've gotten older, every now and then we wonder, are they going to think this isn't fair and be annoyed? And I asked them this Christmas, we, we took a family hike, a big family hike, and I, I asked our second son, you know, does this seem fair? I'm really, you know, what do you want from us? You know, I want to make sure that we're not doing something that you think is selfish and self-absorbed and, you know, uncaring or whatever to you guys. And he said, actually, I'm terrified of being dependent on you and mom. So, you know, we've tried to, without, I mean, we're, you know, it's one of the topics that people generally, and I certainly am quite uncomfortable talking about money all the time, but we've tried to check in with our kids to make sure that they aren't resentful or think we're somehow being so selfish and, you know, it's all about how we're such great people, blah, blah, blah. But that actually they're much more concerned and worried about the idea of being appendages to us as opposed to fully independent and self-realized people. And have they engaged in any of the philanthropy as of yet? I mean, are they involved in any of the work you're doing? <laughs> yes, to some degree, but they also go off on their own causes. So our daughter's very involved with 350.org, but she did take, um, during her gap year, about three months to support go on Prop 23. This is a girl who hated to order her own food or talk on a telephone. I think she made 4,000 cold calls or something. <laughs> but she's completely on... Um, directed by us. I mean, she definitely does what she wants to do. And the other kids all <clears throat> have areas of interest, whether it's like stem cell opportunity research and or the educational uh, sort of education of at-risk youth out of doors. I mean, they, they go, they've definitely gone their own so path. So you've got the philanthropic gene, but not necessarily your passions. Right. They found, they're finding your own. Got right. it. Um, I know that the folks who have signed the Giving Pledge get together, um, have gotten together. Is it, are, in those conversations, is, as a group, is there any agenda there? Or um, beyond wanting the world to understand that those who have been successful are ready to give back? You know, I think that the people who organize the Giving Pledge have been very nervous about having people who they sign up think they're soliciting them for their interests very concerned and they want to make sure that that isn't what pe because I think that pe they think people do that all the time probably to those people so they want to make sure that they don't feel that. I think it's been focused much more on how to think about this, how to be effective regardless of your area of interest and so and it, it's been much more along those lines about how to manage your life, how to manage your giving, how to participate, how to think about it, how to be effective. I will say that I have met some people who share um, some of the subject areas that I happen to be particularly interested in. And I've definitely met some people there, or I've actually, in, in, in the cases, re-met some, well, met and re-met people who I consider to be, for me, they generally tend to be a little bit older, and they're incredible models of you know, I've met a, a guy named Chuck Feeney, who I don't know if you guys have ever heard of, who I consider to be one of the most amazing, thoughtful people I've met. I, I've met a, a group of people who I thought I could learn a lot from in the way they thought about it, even if it's in a different area. So I, I think it's much more about 
being effective and helping people be effective, whatever their area of interest is. I've actually uh, not participated as much in the gatherings just because of scheduling conflicts. But I must say, initially I entertained the thought that we were all just canceling each other out because there are pretty different strident points of view represented in the group. But I recently thought maybe this is one uh, one piece of turf where we could actually rebuild our muscles in civil discourse because it would be a shame to just cancel each other out and not actually exchange thoughtful ideas. Um, you've talked a little bit about the values and principles that have guided you. Could you elaborate that on a, li a little bit and how they've applied to each of the things that you have, that you have gotten involved in? You want me to do that? So I, I did try and think about this a little bit, so this might actually be remotely um, organized, which I'll apologize for up front. Um, you know, obviously, if you're going to get involved in any area and try and be serious about it, then you've got to have, you have to care about it. I mean, the number one thing, as far as I'm concerned, is if you don't have a passion for it, don't waste your time on it. Because I don't think you'll be really effective. I don't think it'll be fun. And I don't think if it's fun, you're really going to put in the time or, you know, really, in, it, you'll, it just won't happen. So I think the number one rule for me has been, what are the things that get my juices going. And you know, there are things where I just am, you know, as I was saying, I'm just a freak about it. I, I'm incredibly serious about it, and I'm willing to go very, very, very far to try and accomplish the things that I think are very important. So that's one. I, the second thing that I think is true that I mentioned before, I think that leadership is unbelievably important in these organizations. It is, it, and whether you, you want to be the, you're involved and you want to be the leader yourself or you're starting a new organization or you're supporting an existing organization. My experience in watching over the last 10 to 15 years of which of these you know, operations have had the continuing impact, have grown, have increased what they're doing, have basically done a terrific job, it's all been about the leadership. So for instance, you know, we have a, a friend who started something called the North Carolina Self-Help Credit Union. I mean, I can't imagine anything that sounds less exciting, less, you know, sort of promising. That sounds like, you know, a, a, a true soporific. For our, if you can't sleep, let's talk about the North Carolina Self-Help Credit Union. <laughs> and the guy who runs it is absolutely a fantastic guy. And he has made it so important, and he's such a leader that he's taken this tiny little operation and made it a powerhouse. Nationwide, he's a thought leader. I have so much respect for what, who he is and what he's done. You know, and so I, I could give you other examples. But so the second, I think passion's one, leadership's two. You know, we talked about involvement. You know, Catherine and I, if you're really passionate about something, whether you're leading or not, you want to feel as if you're participating. And I think you'll make much better decisions because, and measurement, the fourth is measurement, which Kat mentioned, because you want to be honest with yourself. One of the big issues in nonprofits is, it's easy if you're running a business. You know, people think it's hard to have a bottom line, and in some ways it is, but in many ways it simplifies your life. Here it is, you know, and everybody accepts, you know, revenues, expenses, bottom line, how are we doing? So that actually is a constant measurement and it pushes people and it informs their decision making. If you have to give yourself some honest to God metrics to see how you're doing because it doesn't mean you're wrong if it's not turning out well, but it means you should change or you should ask yourself why is it happening that way. And the last one's adjustment. You know, if there isn't a measurement, if you aren't holding yourself to a standard, you can keep doing the same thing and not forcing yourself to change if what you're doing isn't really having the results that you actually care about. So one of the, you know, I feel like I desperately want the stuff we do to be real world, to have impact, to have dirt under our fingernails. So I'll, I'll give you one last example on that. You know, I am on the board of something called the Center for American Progress in DC. And it's kind of a think tank. You know, it was started by uh, a chief of staff named John Podesta, who I have immense regard for. I think he's incredibly 
high integrity, very hardworking, humble, smart, effective guy. And he has spent, as a think tank, I think it's okay, but he basically thinks through the things and then he tries to get action on it. He tries to have impact. He tries to make change in the actual world. And I think he's, you know, he's, you can measure that. You can see how that's happening. And you can also measure what he's doing online. How many people go to his site and read the blogs? How many, and so I view that as if you can measure impact, if, if you can have impact in the real world, to me, that's the payoff. You know, be, as Catherine was saying, that that is the thing that makes me feel like we're accomplishing something. I would just amplify two points because banking definitely falls into the same boring but important category. But you can take a new tack on an old saw and it gets a lot better. So we do an awful lot of creative media. I sing songs all the time about the bank. We just do anything that's shock and awful to change it up a little bit because we're not going to get away from the fact that it's important. Financial instincts, financial education, whatever you call it, it's really important and it's literally killing a bunch of people so we have to overcome that. Um, the other thing is to amplify on the leadership point. Uh, it's taken me a long time to realize that what I know is actually a constraint on what I could know. I come into every situation with a certain frame of mind or expectations about the outcomes or presumptions about the inputs, and I'm often wrong. Uh, particularly about leadership, it comes from the most unlikely quarters sometimes, and the only way you can find that out is to be super inclusive in your decision making. Like open up the conversation to everybody in the room and then see what really happens in the sort of leadership race. And I, often I'm really surprised. So for both of you, what does success look like in the long term? Well, in my view, we have to utterly transform the financial service sector, um, but not in a way that the big banks wouldn't continue to sponsor this event. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a migration strategy, both at the ranch and the bank. We want to get big enough to be influential and sort of annoying so that we can suggest a model that's utterly more sustainable for people and the planet, but that the other large institutions would come to. Because once you educate enough consumers about what banking can be, and we call that beneficial banking, they don't settle for something less. They become more informed, empowered consumers. It's a really big pipe dream, probably. It sounds like it when we're a teeny bank and against, up against the big financial service system but it's what we have to do. I mean, there's nothing short of that that is, constitutes success. So, so success, let, let me just say, Catherine always quotes this one uh, line about success, which is, it's amazing how much you can get done if you don't worry about who gets the credit. And so in the things that I am you know, intense about, committed to, I, we were talking one day about energy and climate. And Kat said, look, you have to accept the fact that you, you should be willing in this effort to be a janitor if necessary, if that's going to be the best you know, for pushing this forward. And I was like, could I please not be the janitor? <laughs> could, could I have a slightly different role than that? But I do think, you know, it, when I think about success, I mean, I'm thinking in super grandiose real world terms because I feel as if I'm just, I'll give you one tiny little commercial for what I care about. I feel as if we're in this extremely urgent time where there, there is a gigantic threat to us and everybody else. And it's, you know, a crisis where we need to react as a people to, and do the right thing. So from my point of view, success is going to be mobilizing tons of people to awareness and to, t to basically action that will cause the right outcomes. And so there's nothing short of that that's going to, that I'm going to consider success. I, you know, there's nothing about me that I'm going to consider to be, if I get something good out of this, every, you know, as a result of these two props, a lot of nice people were very nice to me and said nice things about me. But the actual success that I'm concerned about is that if we can actually push and get the right policies so that we can, you know, both 
do well as a country and save ourselves from a crisis that seems to me to be overwhelmingly obvious and overwhelmingly urgent. Do you have um, any advice for somebody who's sort of on the early stage of this? Is there anything you learned in the process that you wished you had known? I, I have the mistakes answer. I remember that one. <laughs> so early on, we made um, two mistakes that were at least quite instructional. We went in big time to the education arena, and this was after the Gates Foundation and Hewlett and Packard and numbers of others had wrestled with it. And um, it's just the biggest ocean of a swimming pool in the world. And so as a result, it, it was just too big for us. And after two years of swimming around in circles, we receded because we thought we should get out of the way and make our resources available for other things because they're bigger, smarter, stronger, faster groups looking at this. The other is we also had a misadventuring foray into international development. And in that case, we were just too bloody ignorant. We had no idea what we were doing and we were wholly unsuccessful. So we've left that field to others bigger, better, faster, stronger than us as well. Well, the thing that I think is, I still come back overwhelmingly as a lesson to the people. Be and, and, and let me say, I, I mean, I talked a lot about what I think is the importance of leadership, but I think the other thing that's really key in these areas is trusting other people. And that has to do with both knowing what you don't know and being able to figure out who does know it and let them carry the ball in the areas where they're smarter, more experienced, more helpful. Because it seems to me that in almost all these areas, you're going to be doing something at least somewhat new as you get going. And so I've always found that if you ally yourself with really talented people and trust them, you know, I spent the first 21 years of my life basically playing on sports teams. And, you know, if you're going to be the left fullback on a soccer team, you have to really trust the right wing to put the ball in the net. And that's really a, a truism for me in life. You really want to get the best right wing and you really want to trust him or her. And so when we've been wrong, I mean, Catherine was talking about international development. And, and we did do this, in, in, you know, amazingly, in, in, in retrospect, dumb thing. But the dumb part of it in my mind was, we trusted somebody who was an old friend of mine and who, re, you know, he, it was about doing things in developing countries. And as I said, he's street smart. He's smart about Park Avenue and Fifth Avenue. That is not going to get, you know, it, it was a dumb decision on our part, not because it was a dumb idea, but because we, you know, the people running it weren't going to make the adjustments. Even if the original idea had been good, things changed. And a great leader would have you know, picked that up and we would have, you know, two years before we figured it out, he or she would have figured it out and we would have been fine. So in my mind, the biggest thing, I do think leadership is critical, but I think allying yourself with talented people and trusting them to do their jobs and to be part of the team is the thing that will, you know, make your passions come true or you'll find yourself uh, very frustrated. Well, I would like to thank both of you very much for coming down here and talking to us today. I want to thank Jeff Cowan, who encouraged you to come down and be with us. We very much appreciate that. And I want everyone in the room to know that immediately after this session, up in the boardroom, I think, is another um, session where there's, uh, that Jeff will have a conversation and go into more detail about some of the specific work that Tom and Kat are doing with um, the bank and with climate and energy, um, with Jim as well on Common Sense um, and the Center for the Next Generation. So I highly encourage all of you to join us for that and continue this conversation upstairs in a few minutes. Could I just um, intercede one thing because we mentioned that all of us stand on the shoulders of others, whether they be the people who wrote the Magna Carta or fought in World War II. I mean, very, very big, important people went before us. And I wanted to acknowledge two um, who might be familiar to you all. Forrest Shumway, uh, who is the, a consummate business leader, uh, the architect of Allied Signals, a very large international conglomerate, 
a graduate of Stanford College, University undergrad and the law school, a Marine, um, a native of Maine originally, but a real, true Californian, devoted to independent college and university education and a great philanthropist himself, was on, uh, I think joined USC in 1968, was served as treasurer at one point, and was chairman of the board ultimately from 91 to 95. And he passed away this December 4th, and uh, there were very nice things written about him here and elsewhere. But I'm very sad to say the next thing I'm about to say, but we really want to acknowledge his daughter as well, Brooks Shumway, whose real name was Sandra Brooks Shumway, actually a classmate of Wendy's at Marlboro, the Marlboro School. Uh, Brooks ran the Tomcat Charitable Trust for us from 2006 until last month. She struggled with cancer her whole life from uh, infant, cancer during her infancy. Um, stoically and with great aplomb, she never complained, but she did pass to complications from cancer surgery um, late, uh, or actually very early in January of this year. We're still, we can hardly talk about it. It's um, so shockingly um, sad. But we, I wanted to call her out today She's a graduate of Dartmouth. She's a JD MBA from Stanford, like myself. She worked um, for Time Life and then for uh, in an export position in commerce. And then went to the private sector also in uh, promoting exports. Then went to work for the World Affairs Council. But when she came to work with us at the Tomcat Trust, as our dear friend and colleague over so many years, she described it as her best job ever. And she uh, presided over the trust with enormous dignity and intelligence, um, a wry sense of humor, and a sense of determination that we thought nothing could ever bring down. I'm quite certain it hasn't. I feel she's actually now operating free of her worldly constraints and killing it just somewhere else. But um, in honor of the two of them, uh, thank you very much for having us today, and uh, in respect also for her brother, Garrett Shumway, and her mother, Mrs. Shumway, who are still grieving, but um, it's really important to acknowledge those who went before. So thank you for letting me take a moment.